Welcome everyone to the latest joint threat web hunting webinar, Think Like an Actor, Think You Like an Actor, Hunting the Ghost in the Machine from Cyborg Security and Coraline. As we keep saying, we're big fans of show and don't, show it, don't tell. So we're gonna have a great session planned for you today that is going to look at a scenario that is often top of mind for SOC and CISOs. What happens if an adversary gets past our perimeter? This practical session is gonna demonstrate behavioral threat hunting using a wide array of various telemetry data. And it's going to highlight why e technologies like EDR are not sufficient for robust adversarial tracking. But before we get ahead of ourselves here, we have some quick housekeeping that we want to get out of the way. First and foremost, if anyone has any questions throughout the webinar, of course, please drop them into the chat session right away. We'll respond directly or highlight your questions during the question and answer session at the end of the webinar. We want everyone to know that this webinar is being recorded and that an on-demand version of the webinar will be made available to all registrants shortly after the conclusion. Additionally, feel free to check out some of the great resources available in the handout section, as well as in the welcome message. And then there's going to be a two minute survey at the end of the webinar. We use these sur surveys to make us great content to help you help, uh, help, help you help us make great content that you want to see. We encourage everyone to fill it out. Lastly, we're having an amazing giveaway exclusively for webinar attendees. The prizes include an iPad and two Raspberry Pis. If you'd like to enter, stay till the very end of the webinar and then fill out the survey. The last question the survey will allow you to enter. Now with that out of the way, let's get into it. So first, let's do some quick introductions. Um, I'll introduce myself first. My name is Nick Hunter. I'm a technical product marketing manager here at Corelite. Previous to Corelite, I worked as a SOC incident manager for about seven years. Uh, and in that time, uh, I was also a technical field enablement with Semantic Cybersecurity Services Group. I was responsible for creating quite a bit of content and delivering technical sales enablement around the world. The other voice you'll be hearing today is Brandon Denker. He is the Director of Threat Research at Cyborg Security. Brandon has over 13 years of experience in cybersecurity covering network and endpoint analysis, security operations management, threat intelligence, and incident response. At Cyborg Security, Brandon heads up an amazing team of threat hunters, security researchers, and content engineers. All right, let's dive into the scenario. So before we jump into this, the scenario, I wanna take one second to highlight two of the tools you're gonna to be seeing used today. The first is Cyborg Security Threat Hunting plat Content Platform, Hunter. Not to be confused with my last name. Hunter is what we'll talk, of, take a, talk a little bit more about as we go through today's threat hunting session. The second is Coralite Sensor Platform. With that out of the way, let's get into today's session. So for today's scenario, we're beyond the trail of a fictional threat hunting group that is known as the Ghost Gang. While the Ghost Gang may, may be fictional, but their TPPs are very real, and they are based on several well-known threat groups. The Ghost Gang is known to target particularly large companies, usually with revenues exceeding 50 billion annually. They are known to conduct ransom and extortion operations against their victims, usually by first slipping instantly and silently past traditional defenses co companies have in place, then moving silently through the environment, using clever methods to evade usual on-disk detection until they find their target, at which point the ghost gang deploys their malware. Recently, the ghost gang purchased access to a target that seemed to be too good to, to be true. It's the Capsule Corporation from the creators of DinoCaps. The Capsule Corporation it is going to be uh, today's hunting environment. It's one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the United States, grossing over $1 billion a year in revenue and has more than 10,000 employees. 
This makes them a particularly juicy target for the ghost gang. The capsule group also has threat hunting teams assigned to many of the individual departments of the company. We're going to focus on one department, and that's the research division, specifically because the research division conducts some of the capsule corps' most sensitive work, including work on the famous dino caps. Now the ghost gang just started their intrusion, so let's see what they do. All right. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, so my name is Brennan. We're going to put on a few different hats today and walk through a little bit of what it would look like from the ghost gang side and then also taking a look at what a threat hunter might see in terms of logging uh, on the wire in terms of network activity. So first, we're going to start with the ghost gang side. So one of the things that I firmly have always believed as a threat hunter that is incredibly important uh, to kind of understand before you even go down the rabbit hole of threat hunting is how does a an attacker even get into an environment? You know, we we typically pretty well understand vulnerabilities and things that such, but how they actually look like in logging can be vastly different from your comprehension when you go out and read an article about what's actually going on. And then not only that, once they gain that initial foothold, what are some common things that attackers do? You know, we, we keep pushing attackers into a smaller and smaller box, or at least that's the hope, but a lot of times they can escape that box with relative ease because of just built-in you know, features. And I say that with air quotes. So, Today we're going to be utilizing Metasploit. It's a uh, primarily because it's out there. It's easy to get to get if you want to use it within your lab environment, as well as a lot of the framework, uh, if not almost all of it, is a is a good framework for Cobalt Strike, which seems to be a tool of choice for a lot of threat actors and malware operators. So a lot of the modules overlap, uh, and it's a good. Uh, it's, it's a good example of some of the features and some of the things that you can do with just slight variations in the modules. Um, so with that, putting on my ghost gang hat and let's kind of dig in. So as, as uh, Nick mentioned, we, we already got access through a access broker, which has become an incredibly useful service for threat actors because we no longer have to do a lot of that passive uh, recon or active recon for that matter. We can just get a credential or sometimes just a backdoor that they installed and we can just purchase that outright and then start our attack. So although we did that, I kind of wanted to demonstrate a little bit of what that looks like uh, to get that level of access uh, right from the get-go. And today we're going to be taking a look at log for shell So we did a lot of the reconnaissance. Uh, and for time's sake, I'm not going to necessarily cover all of that bits and pieces, but the, you can utilize uh, the Google hacking database to get some good passive recon on a company about what tools you're utilizing, what is the underpinnings of a lot of their public services. And then alongside with that, then you can start doing some of the active recon and actually poking and prodding a little bit at their, at their uh, web services to start and see what you can actually get access to. Uh, and Shodan's another great tool from the attacker standpoint. So we go ahead and have our, our modified exploit configured here with all of our various different IPs, and we're going to send that exploit through the XAPI version header. And when we actually run it, we're gonna see this is what our header actually looks like on the wire. And you know, first time around, it, it didn't actually work. So we modified a little bit and the second time around, we can see we got a shell opened. And if we look at our path here, we're most likely, uh, this, is, this exploits the actual Java application running on the target system. So first and foremost, to ensure quick delivery of my malware and ensure that we're not have a less chance, I guess, of being caught rather than 
delivering something and potentially alerting to a the presence of a attack. We're going to utilize PowerShell as a built-in tool, and we're going to change the execution policy so we can start running some things. And then we're going to download a VBS file that we happily disguise as a uh, JPEG file. And then we're going to go ahead and execute that file. So over here on the right-hand side, if you're curious what's actually in that VBS file, you can take a look at it here. And But I'm going to gloss over that a little bit and kind of get to what, what we're actually trying to do here. So we're trying to use built-in tools to execute a VBS script that will basically send out a beacon to our attacker host so we can get a interpreter shell, uh, which is what we've done here. So we've had it reach out on 3128 uh, back to our attacker machine. And the first thing we wanna do is just kind of get a lay of the land. So we've disabled some of the security tools from that uh, initial VBS script so we can get our tools running uh, easily, but not completely killing the service of those tools. So that's kind of is an important distinction is if we start stopping the services and doing stuff that's a little bit more blatant, then it'll shorten our window most likely of, trying, of being detected within the environment. So we get our sysinfo and we get an idea of what our shell is as well as what the architecture of the machine and just kind of getting, again, a lay of the land and understanding where we are and what we what we have potentially available to us. So if we wanna actually get credentials, uh, we'll have to match that architecture. So you, we can see here, we're launching a special, the X64 version of Notepad, and we're gonna go ahead and migrate to that. So now we have an X64 um, interpreter shell. But one of the really important things to, to do before we get too far down the rabbit hole and get a little bit of ADD, is we need to install persistence. It's extremely important from our standpoint as we can ensure that we can easily come back to this system, uh, even if it's rebooted, if, especially when we're talking about web services that often get is applied and other things that may kick us from having access to that machine uh, at that moment. So first thing we're gonna do we're just going to go ahead and run a persistence module through our interpreter shell. And we can see here that we have installed persistence under the current run. And if you wanted to be a little bit more stealthy, we can actually define our executable um, and then the path and then even where we want to store it. So it doesn't look quite as obvious for a threat hunter. But in this particular case, we're, we're trying to work through it um, and get down to the meaningful data that hopefully we can get some research data. So next, we don't necessarily want to wait for that system to be rebooted or for that registry key to be activated. So we're going to also install a service. And because we're trying to do this in a quick time period, we're going to have it reach out to us every five seconds. So if we lose our shell, we can quickly gain access back without too much work. There's some other things that you can potentially do here as well as, you know, if we have a credential already from our access brokers, we can potentially enable RDP, and there is a, a nice little Metasploit module for that to easily enable it, and then we could potentially try to log in. So we have a few different avenues, but this is a pretty common one that Kind of hides in the rest of the log, uh, rest of log because services get created all the time, uh, and this is some of the details of that service. So we'll take note of our service here, the ZFRXBUO, and when we jump back into our interpreter session, uh, this is the new one that gets open. So now we have a second one. Again, we're on an x86. This time we're not going to migrate because we already have an X64 session open, so we don't need to worry about that at the moment. It's just getting a, an understanding of our privileges, where we're working from, and you can see here, we have our X86 and our X64 sessions going. 
So now we're going to go ahead and so we've already taken our uh, disabled some of the security services to make sure that we're not going to get detected easily. So we're going to go stage our malware for our capsule core. And we're just going to toss that into a temp directory since it's pretty predictable when we create the scheduled service for that to run. This is our ransomware that we're going to set on a schedule, depending on how this attack goes, probably for the next two days. So that way we're a little bit out of the network before we, and we make sure we got all the data that we want before we actually ransom the network. And this is really important, right? We wanna make sure and get as much meaningful information and data before we hold their systems ransom, because if they can recover from some backups, then it rendered, we'll have a little less to go by. So we want to make sure we're getting as much data as we go. Um, one of the really cool fun, really cool things about Interpreter is a search feature that is leaps and bounds faster than just running it. If I were on an RDP session, just doing like a search within Explorer, this returns back in a few seconds. Uh, so I can search for things like password or trouble or any kind of string that I want. So since we're on the web server, I'm not really expecting any research information, but I can probably do a few a few more searches here to see if I find anything else. This is more run just to see if I could get some architecture documents or you know from some troubleshooting stuff, or probably could have ran like I said a few more searches there. Uh, next thing we're going to do is go further and start trying to get a better understanding of the system we're actually working on. So we kind of started with making sure we have our the shell set up properly, we get our persistence done, and then now start to enumerate services, enumerate the domain, get a better understanding of the environment around us. The services are really important. So the services will allow us to see if we missed an AV or if there's something else that's logging that we might want to shut down. Um, often, you know, if we turn off logging or we turn off process logging, for instance, we can get that specific. So if we know that, for instance, if we scroll down here, we'll see Sysmon running, uh, Sysmon64, we could do a search for the configuration file for Sysmon and basically kill it from monitoring any process executions or we could add exceptions for the things that we want to be able to utilize it's a lot more stealthy thing than necessarily turning off logging uh, completely or removing logging because that's something that typically bubbles up uh, so this is a way that we can hinder their defenses even more than we've already done and since there won't be a basically logging of truth of what actually occurred in the system without some memory forensics or something else like that, it helps us even more in the long run. So if we expect to do some stuff, we can probably just kill some of this or uh, we might even be able to edit the Windows uh, logging properties as well uh, while we're on the system. But main reason why I wanted to run this was to show to, we have our service running, that's our backdoor back into the system. So again, gathering is a little bit more information. We're going to run this WMIC command to get an idea of their patch level. You know, are they keeping up with patches? Gives us a little bit of insight to the company itself of are they keeping up with things? Are they several revisions, several versions behind, uh, several patches behind? Uh, so if there are several patches behind, it's great for us, right? We can potentially have a few more exploits in our of things that we want to use as we start to move throughout the environment. Next, we can see here we're doing some user and group enumeration for the domain. Uh, one of the, the important ones to point out here is we were able to get the domain admin group information and we have this account, SA admin and administrator. So we're going to go ahead and take a look and gather more details of that SA admin account. <laughs> So we can indeed verify it is a domain admin account and get an idea of when their last logon was, if they have restrictions around that, um, password restrictions, things like that. 
And it even says that we're allowed to change the password if, if we really wanted to. So this is some great information. Once we're able to get access to this account, maybe we can crack a password or better yet, if we can get a token for that particular user, either impersonate the token or a plethora of things as the attacker. So going a little bit further down and we're, we tried to get the SID for that particular account, couldn't get it, but we went ahead and got it for the uh, administrator. And we just uh, exited out of our shell. So we are on the X64 version of our Metis, um, interpreter prompt. And now we're gonna do some domain enumeration. So we already kind of knew this was our DC, but we just run that quick enumeration just to make sure we have the right target. It gives us a little bit of operating system information as well. If we need to potentially exploit it or do something else. And then our users on the domain, you can see we have one more user that we didn't know about. Uh, TS Research, uh, which is of interest to us as well. And then our other computers that are attached to the domain. Since we're on a Windows system, these are some common things that we'll want to do is just to see, are we part of the domain? So that way it makes it easier for them to administer. Um, and we have this research system here that definitely high of interest, right? We're, we're going to want to try and get to that system as quickly as possible so we can start to gather our data out and offload it. We're just gonna do a quick NS lookup on those guys and making sure we capture the right IPs for them. So we can see they're on different subnets. So it would be pretty hard to believe that from this web server we have access to this research system, but some weird things happen once you're in the environment. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and do our hash dump. So we're gonna get some credentials before we start doing some scanning just in case we get, uh, we lose access to this particular shell. So we'll get some of the, uh, through Kiwi or Mimikatz, there's some easy commands that you can run for creds, uh, creds all in this particular case. You can look at LSA secrets, uh, you can look at Kerberos tickets, a uh, ton of different things. So in this case, these are just a few of the, of the quick things that I've typically run once in an environment. So we're gonna dump the secrets. And one of the things to point out here is now we have that domain SID as well, and a few other bits and pieces that we can probably forge together to, to try and move laterally within the environment, or at least be able to come back and maintain our persistence. Then we're gonna dump the SAM tables. And then now, uh, this is actually one of the things I get kind of a, a little excited to talk about because I think it's pretty cool, is there's an incognito module for an interpreter that allows you to list the available tokens on the system. And we can potentially impersonate any of these tokens. And one of the ones is an SA admin which is that domain admin account that we that we've been that we want to target because we want to be able to get to the domain controller or be able to get to other systems on the network that are attached to the domain. So we have the domain we have a domain admin grouped account and we can see here we are we successfully impersonated that particular user and now when we do a get UID instead of getting system we get SA admin as part of the Capsule Corp domain, which is pretty cool. So before we start attacking the DC or trying to laterally move or do some other stuff, we're gonna run a quick scan and just see what uh, open ports are there, just in case that there's some other stuff that we may not uh, be expecting, as well as just to verify it actually is the DC. Um, one of the one of the another fun feature of interpreter is we can use what's called auto routes, so it simplifies the process of funneling all of your activity from your tar attacker machine to your target subnets. So this basically lets me say anything destined for that 10.01/24 network will go through my interpreter session 
to that target network within the compromised environment. So we're just going to use a quick port scan. We're going to run some common ports against that whole slash 24, make sure we didn't miss any targets within that uh, subnet. And then we, we would also run this against that 10.0.15 network that that research system is on. But again, the expectation is we shouldn't have access to it. Again, weirder things happen. But we can verify, you know, we, we have some common ports associated with the domain controller that are open to us but we don't have other oddball services that are running on that domain controller that we might be able to exploit. So limits our scope a little bit. So we're going to go ahead and jump back in to our interpreter session that has that is impersonating an SA admin. And now knowing that we're a domain admin, we're going to go ahead and upload a VBS file. And that VBS file is going to allow us to disable the monitoring for Windows Defender, just like we did on our web server. It just allows us to now do it remotely with nothing more than just the permissions of what we have here. You know, we, we could upload our malware and see if we're able to execute it, but to be on the safer side, that might trigger some alerts that we don't really want to go out there. So we're gonna go ahead and just do this real quick. We've uploaded it but we still need to execute it. And there's a couple different ways. You can do a scheduled task. You can do several other things that are kind of built into uh, Metasploit. But one of the ways that I do it is just creating a remote service. We're gonna call it WinDefendLog, and then we're going to start that service down here. So we do expect it to fail in terms of SCs confirmed that is considered because we're actually utilizing C script to run a file versus just starting a binary. So it doesn't quite get the feedback that it's expecting, but it should have still run. So now um, we're going to go ahead and add a route for our web server to our interpreter session as well. And the reason for that is, is that we now wanna be able to receive interpreter reverse shells on the window or on that web server. So one of the things as an attacker that we kind of want to be careful with is how many outbound connections we're making from various different compromised hosts. So we don't want every host that we compromise to reach out straight to the internet to our attacker box. It might be a little bit of a dead giveaway when we have 15 systems reaching out to one foreign IP that they haven't observed in a long time. So we're going to route all of our traffic through the web server. Um, so <clears throat> as we can see down here, we're going to use a credential that we got before for the SA admin account for that uh, NTLM hash. And we're going to move to the DC. And we can see here, it actually set up a listener on our web server that we have compromised. So everything's going to come back to that web server, server over port 80 to, uh, and then back to our attack machine, attacker machine. So that way, again, we're not potentially tipping them off by having a domain controller just reaching out to some random uh, IP on the internet uh, through an odd port or something of that sort. So <clears throat> to confirm we're on the DC, that's our DC IP address, so we know we're in the right place. And we kind of go through all the same same steps of making sure we get persistence so we don't have to constantly move back to the DC, uh, checking the security tools, checking services, all that kind of stuff. But one of the things I wanted to quickly show just to verify that that VBS file did run and executed properly is we can see we added our exclusion path for C and then we also disabled real-time monitoring. So disabled real-time monitoring is true, which is awesome. That means our VBS file executed as we hoped. And that's why when we moved laterally, we weren't detected by Windows Defender. Um, then we also, for the sake of it, this is a little excessive, probably will get, probably a bad idea actually in hindsight. Um, but we can do a lot of stuff with the firewall in terms of allowing specific ports, allowing 
just the traffic that we want to get through that system. And then, as I mentioned, you know, we're going to do some, some quick persistence, making sure that we can get back to the system and we're going to start doing our data gathering. So as I keep scrolling down here, we're going to migrate to an X64. So we'll be able to get some credentials that's next to persistence. That's probably the, the, the most important thing of, while we're on the DC in, to make sure before we get booted or something happens that we can get as many credentials as we possibly can. Uh, as you can see here, we got some information on the SA admin, and then quite possibly one of the most important aspects of what we got here was the Kerberos ticket uh, NTLM hash. So this will allow us, with alongside this uh, SID, to create a golden ticket that we can come back later uh, and be able to get back to the DC as an unprivileged starting with an unprivileged user going back to the DC much easier. Uh, which is exactly what we're gonna do is we're gonna list out the tokens that are available to us and then we're going to uh, get, go ahead and create that golden ticket. So our, I'm able to write out, even though I'm in interpreter, I'm able to write out to my local system that golden ticket. So it'll expire in 999 hours. And then that's the Kerberos uh, ticket hash, and then the SID that we need to create it. Um, I put in here SA admin, but in all honesty, we can impersonate any, any account that we really want to. So now that we have that, we're gonna take a quick check on that research subnet and see what other systems we have available to us. And we can see here that we do have 3389 open. So before we kind of do a ton of other stuff, it might just be easiest to try. We did see that one particular domain user, uh, Captain, forget the rest of the name there, uh, that we might just want to try and crack that password before we go too far, given we know that this system is probably on the domain and checking to see if we could just RDP into it. But one of the reasons why I, I harp so hard on persistence is this is one of those reasons. Just running the module, right? And all of a sudden we lost our access, which is no, no good. Uh, we, our interpreter session died. It can die for any, any number of reasons, uh, especially if we're starting, once we get a couple layers deep on what, and you know, when we start funneling traffic through our first session, and we get a couple layers deep, it could get, really unstable pretty quickly. Um, so all we have to do is just set up our handler to get our interpreter shell back. And that's exactly what we did here. So we set, it set up that handler on our web server on port 5001, which was what our persistence was set to. And now we are right back where we started. So for the, for the sake of time, the rest of this, um, you know, now that we're on the DC, we can pretty much have relative unfederated access to that research system that we want to get to. So the next things we're probably going to want to do is, like I said, take a look at the dump, the credentials we dumped and see if we can get a valid credential uh, to log in over RD, RDP. That would probably be the easiest, especially since it's open. It's probably a normal method that other users use to get to that system. And then we start to poke around and get an understanding, maybe create a few accounts and things that such. Or we could use exactly the same methods that we did to get to the DC, upload a few files, disable some of the security monitoring, and then start to stage our ransomware on that server so we can upload the binary, our ransomware binary, and then set a scheduled task. We can do all of that remotely uh, without actually having to actually log into that machine. So with that, I'm going to take off my ghost group hat and pivot over to the threat hunting side. So to kind of wrap up uh, a lot of the things that a attacker can do is if they find a method, more often than not, there's why change the tactic if we know a method works. So uploading my DBS file to disable security services 
I can just keep doing that over and over and it doesn't appear that I'm being caught or any bad things are happening from me. So I don't need to go change my tactic until that tactic breaks. If it doesn't work the way that I expect it, or if it gets caught by AV, then I have to kind of go back to the drawing table and start some other route. Uh, and once you're in an environment as an attacker, you can also emulate your own environment. Once you kind of understand where, what kind of tools and what patch level they have. So you can even start to play around in your own test and test environment and then go back and finish out your attack on that particular target. <clears throat> so we've talked about what the attacker looks like, a little bit of the commands that can be run. And, but it's not, especially when you utilize an interpreter, you're not really, you don't really understand or know what exactly is being run, like what that shows like in logs to a threat hunter. So we're gonna utilize, utilizing the Cyber Security's Hunter platform, we're gonna first take a look at a common technique. So one of the things that you that we noticed from what uh, Ghost Gang did just now was that they disabled security controls. This is something that is growing in popularity, especially with the how good Defender has gotten some of Defender has gotten at detecting some of these more advanced binaries and threats and things that we're seeing a lot of malware operators and threat groups that just disable the security service or at least hinder it useless. Maybe not completely kill it. Like I said, we don't want that to pop up in a dashboard somewhere as the attacker. So they're just making sure that they can get their, their malware through. So we're gonna go ahead and search for a defender and see what we get. For those who have never seen what you're looking at here, this is, like I mentioned, this is the Hunter portal from Cyber Security. Uh, it's a bunch of, it, it's a great collection of hunt packages and behavioral queries and a ton of information that goes with all of those to kind of help guide threat hunters through the process. And we're going to look for Windows Defender tampering. Uh, so we can have some key manipulation there that might work. But we're going to look at tampering in general. So some common techniques that an attacker might use to just stop Defender from catching them. Uh, there's, as you notice, there's several different ways that this technique can be employed. That's why there's multiple packages available. So right here at the front, we have all the tools that are supported and you know, my, my tool that's compatible with Splunk, which is why you see that here on the top. You get a description, metadata, and then quite possibly the most important thing, is being a little bit tool agnostic if the tool that you're looking for is not in the not above you can at least get the uh, query logic to develop it for the for your own tool which is awesome and then some analyst notes to kind of give you some updates about who's utilizing it how they're doing it just some technical bits and pieces uh, to help a threat hunter understand maybe what they're looking at references and then one of the best parts is the run book and the mitigation recommendations this helps a threat hunter validate the traffic that they're looking at and ensure that that what was actually found is what was intended to be found uh, through the hunt or the behavior and then the mitigation recommendations uh, which kind of tells you like what to look at next you know uh, that, that sometimes it's the hardest part about threat hunting is okay i found something bad but what what do i do now like if i don't understand the full attacker's capability without doing a ton of extra research it can give us a little bit more insight into what's going on there so here's our queries we get the you can also see there's some emulation validation just to make sure we're getting the right monitor the logging and then any gotchas in terms of deployment requirements, and then any notes I've added to it uh, as I go along. So we're gonna go ahead and copy our query here. And I wanna keep my, my time frame here. So we'll paste that guy in and then just add my time frame. 
So go ahead and run that. And uh, you know, you, for those watching, if you want, you can take a look and see some of the things that are here in the top about what we might be looking for. But what what we get here in return is we can see we have two different devices that we observe this on. And we see the same commands run twice. So on each each uh, server, which is kind of interesting. We can see between the two of them ran five times. But what's kind of interesting to point out here is we have a C script, CMD, and W script execution. Why the three variations, right? It, they're running the same command effectively, and we can see this one has a slight variation is it didn't append the full path of powershell it was just run powershell.exe so it's a little bit of an outlier from the other two but we're going to want to take a look and see what what actually happened on these two hosts first of all um let me back up a few steps here there we go um <clears throat> so here we just we grouped it by the uh, command itself, but we're gonna wanna look at what's going on with our domain controller, and then what's going on with our web server. So if, from the threat hunting side, right, if we're looking and we see this activity, since they're effectively the same commands, this could be two different infections that maybe something occurred and something malicious got ran on these systems, or these could be connected. Um, so we have to find that out and verify that what we're seeing is actually part of something malicious. So if we quickly hop back to Hunter here and we can take a look at the mitigation steps and we wanna look probably at some, some uh, process execution as well as maybe some PowerShell execution uh, afterwards and also verify that this probably wasn't our system administrator doing some maintenance or some other reason for have, for running this exclusion or whatever the case may be. So we're gonna quickly pretend and say our administrators say that no that's not what they did but we all know as threat hunters that sometimes we just kind of have to, to keep digging in while that question is getting answered. So Let's go ahead and determine what happened on each one of these systems to start with. So the first thing I'm gonna do is we're gonna run a query for our domain controller. And we're putting a little bit of time before and a little bit after if we noticed that is was at 533. Um, so I know we're getting kind of close here to the end, so hopefully we can get through get through it all and find out everything that's happened on these hosts. Uh, so we looked at it a little bit before, a little bit after, and this is solely just looking at the domain controller. And we can see here, this is the, one of the commands, and then this was the other command that we initially caught from our hunt. And C script was how it was executed. Right, so we can kind of get an understanding of why that is. So C script executed this when defend, and if we really wanted to, we could quickly just run that when defend across the environment for that time for that time frame, or maybe a little bit even more broad, and see where that pops up. See if that file exists on other systems, maybe. Um, more often than not, you might have to come back to this uh, if you have, uh, depending on your environment, but we go ahead and let that run in the background, uh, knowing that that's something that is of interest to us. Uh, one of the things that I kind of noticed is we also had a services execution right before the VBS file execution, just a few, a few seconds, looks like, uh, actually a few seconds after there you go 3240 so if we scroll over here to the right we have our target objects objects from syspawn and we can see we have a service called wind defend and then a service called wndis driver start and then we have our configuration this is what we're looking for 
So this is actually what was tr run down here and what appears to, to have caused this stuff down here. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, when we were looking through the packages within Hunter, you know, this is one way to also capture the Windows Defender being disabled or otherwise in inhibited. Uh, so the registry key changes. If we scroll over here, we can see the registry value was set for, for that. So <clears throat> it's kind of cool. Like we can already see that there's some bad stuff going on, but we still haven't really answered that question of is this related to what uh, to the web server? So we're going to take a look at the traffic between those two devices just at a high level. So we have our 1098, uh, which is our web server, and then our uh, 182 is our domain controller. And what we're going to be interested in here, if we take out that for the moment, is interesting ports, things that kind of catch our eye. You know, we had a little bit of a gap between the executions of between 24, uh, looks like actually 454, a little bit before and after actually. It's kind of interesting. So 424 and then 533. It's a little bit of a gap. So we want to kind of look for some interesting ports, maybe a lot of data that's being transferred. Um, oh, let's see. So 445 is kind of expected. 88, those are some other services that we see pretty regularly. Uh, let's see if we find anything. Uh, actually, this kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. So one of the paths that got caught by Corelight is the C, the C drive instead of just the what we saw with the IPC dollar sign. So let's go ahead and take that there. And this is a UID. So for those who aren't familiar with Corelight, uh, it's incredibly useful to be able to see everything that happened in that particular session. So that session could last 45 minutes, an hour. It could last a really long time, and we're still going to be able to piece together everything that happened in that network session. So if we go ahead and quickly run this. For those who are looking at this horrible I mess. I this on the web. Oh, thank you. Um, for those who are looking at this horrible long uh, triage query, basically it's presenting all of the useful data from Corelight for me. And as we can see here, we have our wonderful WinVBS file that is of interest to us. And not only did we get the SMB mapping, but we also got that path in the SMB files. So it's coming from our web server to the domain controller. And we look at it, and it's at 5.30, which is just before this. So now we can pretty definitively, based on this core light data, make a, make a pretty good story that this file was transferred and then somehow executed. We still have to kind of answer that question of how it was executed. Was it uh, another malicious? process that did it or some whatever the case may be and we can probably find that out by doing a uh, we did that query actually we ran it in the background right for when defend or am i crazy i believe i'm probably a little bit crazy um <laughs> so <clears throat> In other case, uh, you know, we can quickly run run that across our environment. So instead of looking at our host, we'll just do a quick search for term. And yes. Let's expand our window here to see if we have any other instances of this going on in our environment. And we're coming pretty close on time here, so I'm going to try and get through this, hopefully. Uh, we can see some WScript executions, um, some bitch transfer. Ooh, so we got some 
files being delivered via Discord. If this actually is a result that we didn't expect, we just happened to find WinDefend in the uh, command line there. And then we can see here that we're removing some files. This is when it got written. If we come back over to our hosts, uh, which actually happens to be missing. So let's do that real quick. So that's our web, uh, the domain controller. That's when that DBS file got written. And we can see here, this is a service that got started. And here we go. Perfect. This is what we're looking for, I think. So we can see the web server here created a remote service for when defend to execute that when defend DBS. So now through this hunt threat hunting, we've been able to see that some tools got disabled and then start to dig down that rabbit hole. And we've successfully correlated these two different hosts as part of the same attack. So we can now say the web server was most likely initially compromised. And then we see this remote service being created and executed on our domain controller. And then on the domain controller, we have these other commands being performed as well. Uh, unfortunately, I think I'm right here at the end, but uh, the next things to do as a threat hunter is start to do a little bit of root cause. So we're gonna hand this off to our incident response team and get them involved knowing that we definitely have some stuff going between two servers and a domain controller is involved. So we'll wanna look at credential dumping as some stuff that has occurred, as well as going back in the chain and starting to look at what connections has that, um, that web server made out to the world. So something like this, where we would say and not and then exclude our internal IP space uh, 172 just for the sake of exercise here. So something like this, so we can go back in time and see what other things has that device talked to. Uh, if we're looking at just that as a source, then we can just define it as a source. Um, we can see we have HTTP files over 80 to 172. Actually, that was just a 72. Um, and then, uh, like I said, we can quickly run through all the Corelite data. And the, the wonderful thing about Corelite is we can get a good understanding of what is happening on the network, where we're, especially the lateral traffic between two devices, where you, we're, we, we may not be able to connect the two until we find a random artifact, or it's much easier to go through all that network activity and see how those devices are talking and to start to pick out what may have happened on the network, especially the the SMB traffic is amazing to dig through because there's so many file transfers and stuff like that. And once you've stolen a credential and you're on the domain, SMB is definitely your friend to start moving moving files around. So I'll uh, I'll stop there. And unfortunately, we didn't get to didn't quite didn't quite see the uh, how they got in on the on the intrusion side, but uh, hopefully this was really helpful, uh, and I'll turn it uh, back over to Nick or, Nick or Josh. Thanks, Brandon. And just need to make myself the presenter. It should be able to see this. We're on the right slide here. So uh, thanks, Brandon. You know, that was, you're going through quite a hunt today. And um, I know we'll continue that hunt and put it in a video uh, for you to download if you want to see the rest of it. Um, so just to, to recap real fast, um, you know, what you saw is that many organizations believe, well, they have EDR, they're completely covered. But defenders are responding to incidents, and it's critical that they have the whole picture at both the endpoint and the network level. And additionally, with the growing use of 
create your own devices and IoT devices, not all components are going to have the ability to generate and transfer logs. That's why network visibility is critical. A, it's a major component that can't be overlooked in, in the design of an organizational defense. So for the sake of time, I'm just going to take a second to just talk about one thing real fast. So CoreLight, with their recent release, has some new insights. If we have a new VPN insight for our encrypted traffic collection, and then we have the log for shell uh, detection included with our latest release. Um, real fast, so our encrypted traffic collection is growing. Um, this, What this means is you do not need a decryption package. You can actually use these packages to look at and assess encrypted connections, so no, no decryption is necessary. And now we have the VPN insights that we've added. Um, if with a, we can identify 350 VPN protocols and providers. And last but not least, uh, so from an encrypted traffic analysis perspective, step through this. So we, we do we have the Suricat alert, alerts, the C2 alerts, the protocol logs, the file extraction, smart PCAP. And then for encrypted traffic, we've got protocol logs, JA3 TLS fingerprinting, RDP SSH SSL and CERT insights in our ETC package. And then VPN insights is also part of the encrypted traffic collection package. And as I mentioned, that, can, that package identifies over 350 different VPN protocols and providers. I know we're short on time, so I'm going to go right to what's important to you, which is the question and answer. Hand it over to Josh. Yeah, Nick. So we're really short on time here, but uh, I did want to address a couple of the questions that we got. Uh, Brandon, specifically, uh, for instance, Matthew wanted to know what are the benefits of using x64 versus x86 shell uh, sessions? Um, in all honesty, uh, x86, we can guarantee execution just due to older support. So we won't necessarily know right away uh, without a in-depth poking and prodding at a particular server that it is it will run x64 we can <laughs> there's a growing thing that's probably going to go away eventually uh, but there's some systems that we just know x86 will just run without issue due to compatibility things so that's why we don't necessarily send that x64 package uh right from the, the giveaway <laughs> Awesome. Uh, and one of the other questions Richard had uh, was he wanted to know if the changes that you made to Windows Defender or, for instance, to Windows Firewall um, would be logged to Windows Event Logs. So within the Windows Event Logs and Sysmon monitoring, you'll see them uh, under registry changes, but only if you're pulling the Windows Defender lo uh, specific logging will you necessarily see uh, any changes that are being made to Windows Defender. And a lot of times, some of that stuff can be pretty noisy depending on how many changes that are being made within the environment. But yeah, the registry keys are, are usually the best bet for capturing that stuff. They're just often not looked at. And lastly, we have a question from Zach. Uh, who wanted to know uh, your opinion. Do you find it's more difficult now to be able to get interpreter payloads onto modern operating systems, uh, especially with the advances in Windows Defender that you kind of highlighted earlier uh, and with more modern EDR tools installed? Def definitely. Uh, we struggled a lot with setting up the lab environment for this. Uh, I tried to make sure that I didn't make any changes to Windows Defender out of the box, that it was only from an attacker standpoint that we making that we made changes. Um, but yes, it's getting more and more difficult. And this is also why Cobalt Strike, I think, has become king uh, to a lot of threat actors is because of the easy detection of some of these tools that the Cobalt Strike beacons just work way easier, but they're still relying on the same framework. They're just better at delivering mechanisms. But awesome. Awesome. Um, I just wanted to uh, address a, a number of people who have asked the same question. Uh, so as we mentioned at the beginning, there will be a recording of uh, the webinar and it will be sent out uh, either later today or early tomorrow. Uh, that'll give you access to the, the pre-recording or the, the video on demand version. So you'll be able to kind of uh, review this on your own time as well. Um, with that, I'll hand it back to Nick.
Yes, Josh. So to wrap it up today, um, if you like what you saw today and would like to try out Hunter for yourself, head over to the link below and use the promo code GOES for a few co free community edition account. There you can access dozens of behavioral threat content packages as well as hunting content for the latest exploits, malware, and adversarial techniques. If you sign up using the link at the bottom of the screen and use, coast and use promo code GHOST for your free community edition account. And lastly, don't forget Cyborg Security and Correlate are giving away some awesome prizes exclusively for these for your webinar attendees. All you need to do is fill out the survey at the end of the webinar and answer yes to the question asking if you would like to be entered. And lastly, but don't forget to follow us on social media to check out some of our other content, including threat hunting, deep dives, walkthroughs, free detection content, and much, much more. We'd also like, but we'll be announcing future webinars via these channels. And we took the, again, we appreciate the time you've let us borrow from you from your busy lives. I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thanks everyone. <laughs>